So far we've talked about capacitors purely in the static situation where we have a voltage across the capacitor. We can say what's the charge on the plates of the capacitor, what's the electric field between the plates of the capacitor, but we haven't talked about how we can actually charge up the capacitor. And to understand that we have to include the resistance. There's always going to be some resistance in the circuit and if we take account of that and we uh, include that in our consideration we can get a good idea of how capacitors actually can charge up and discharge in a real circuit. The way we're going to imagine this is we're going to consider circuits in which a capacitor and a resistor are in series with each other. Before I go into the direct physics I want to remind you of some functional forms or more to the point I want you to remind yourself about some functional forms. I'd really like you to at least pause the video after each one of these questions and consider the answer and I'd really like you to actually do the sketches yourself. So to start off plot e to the minus x starting at x equals 0. What does that look like? Once you've got e to the minus x plot 1 minus e to the minus x starting at x equals 0. Next I want you to consider what happens when you change the exponent e to the minus x. So it's going to be e to the minus bx. I want you to consider this from the possibility of b being greater than 1 or b being less than 1. And as a little refresher, with e to the minus x what you get is a decaying exponential. Remember what a decaying exponential looks like? It starts at 1 because e to the 0 anything to the zero power is just one, but then as x increases it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. In fact with every increment of x the function e to the minus x decreases by a constant factor. One minus e to the minus x, well since e to the minus x starts at one and decays to zero, one minus e to the minus x is going to start at zero rise and then saturate at 1. It's going to have an asymptote at 1. e to the minus bx, well the bigger b is, the more quickly the function is going to decay to 0. So if b is greater than 1 then it's going to decay to 0 quickly. If b is less than 1 it's going to decay more slowly to 1. It's going to have the same, what it's going to do is going to scale it along the x-axis. Okay, now to the physics, the actual electronics of the situation. Here's what I want you to consider for charging a capacitor. So we'll have some voltage source with a voltage E. It's going to charge a capacitor through a resistor. So we've got the capacitor and the resistor in series. That means that they have the same current through them. They won't have the same voltage across them necessarily, but they'll have the same current through them. Initially, the capacitor is discharged and we're going to have to consider the time behavior of this system. So we'll say at time equals zero we'll close the switch. So closing the switch is going to define our start of the situation. What's going to happen when we close the switch? Well immediately current is going to start to flow. The resistor is going to oppose the flow of current. The capacitor initially is not going to have any voltage across it, so it'll be quite easy to put charge across the capacitor. As current flows, charge builds up on the capacitor and the voltage of the capacitor will increase. The capacitor then, as time goes on, is going to oppose the flow of current. So the current should start out at its maximum value and then as the capacitor charges up the current is going to decline. The limiting behavior of a capacitor is that initially when there's no charge on it, the capacitor acts as a conductor. It doesn't oppose the flow of current at all. Once the capacitor starts to charge up, then it's applying a back voltage to the system and opposing the flow of current until the capacitor is fully charged or it's charged up to the maximum value that it can be at the voltage that's given, in which case its back voltage is going to be equal to the source voltage and there will be no current through the circuit. What I'd like you to do is to sketch the charge of this capacitor with time. So it starts at zero and 
the charge is going to rise to a maximum value. Then I'd like you to sketch what the current should do with time. What do you expect that to do? Well, we know that the current starts out at its highest value and then decays to zero. So functionally, we're going to expect, at least qualitatively, that the charge is going to track kind of like your 1 minus e to the minus x curve. And the current is going to track pretty much like an e to the minus x curve. So the current is going to decay down to zero. The charge is going to rise up to its maximum value. We can figure out what the initial current is. We can figure out what the maximum charge is using our knowledge of capacitors. The charge is going to have a maximum value of the capacitance C times the voltage. That's the charge, that's what the charge is going to be at infinite time. So at inf after infinite time, there's no current. So the voltage across the resistor is zero and the voltage across the capacitor is the source voltage. If the voltage across the capacitor is the source voltage, then the charge on it is just going to be the capacitance times the source voltage. Functionally, the way this is going to rise is 1 minus e to the minus time. What's this tau? That's going to be a scaling factor to tell you exactly how fast our system reaches its equilibrium saturation value. The voltage across the capacitor is going to be directly proportional to the charge on the capacitor. And that makes sense. That's, that's the capacitor relation. So the two functions are going to be directly proportional to each other. Here, since charge is the capacitance times the voltage, the voltage is going to be the charge divided by the capacitance. The current through the circuit, that's both the capacitor and the resistor, recall we expect to look like a declining exponential. It'll start at, max, at its maximum value and then decline to zero. Well, what is its maximum value? Well, initially, there's no voltage across the capacitor. All the source voltage is across the resistor. So the current will just be the source voltage, E, divided by the resistance. And then as time goes on, that decays to zero. So we're going to have our initial value times a declining exponential. What's the voltage across the resistor going to do? Well, the voltage across the resistor is just I, the current through the resistor, times the resistance itself. And so if we take this I and multiply it by R, the resistance, this is the function we get. We get the source voltage times a declining exponential. So initially, all the source voltage is across the resistor. As time goes on, more and more of it goes across the capacitor and the voltage across the resistor goes to zero as the current goes to zero. Notice that the voltage across the capacitor plus the voltage across the resistor equals the constant value of the source voltage. It has to do that, and so it's nice to see that the equations that we've come up with work that way. What about this tau? First of all, we see from the form of these functions that tau has to be a time has to be something in units of time because the exponent of e has to be a pure number. It has to be dimensionless. And the only way it can be dimensionless is to have the, the units cancel out. So this time constant tau is a time. It's known as the characteristic time of the circuit. One way you can think about what this value actually is, it's the time it takes if the current would stay at the initial value of the current, in other words, the voltage divided by the resistance, if it were going at that current, that's how much time it would take for the total charge Q that's going to accumulate on the capacitor to be transferred. It turns out that the value of this time constant is R the resistance of the resistor times C, the capacitance of the capacitor. What should that mean? We know that this better be a time. It has to be time constant. So R times C 
should give a time. Well, r times c, r is in ohms, and c is in farads. Turns out that an ohm times a farad is a second. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to work out. Just remember that an ohm is a volt per ampere, and a farad is a coulomb per volt. If you multiply those units together and do a little bit of substitution, you should see that you get seconds. What about discharging a capacitor? Let's imagine that we have a circuit like this, where we start off with a charged capacitor. We have it in series with a resistor and a switch. At time zero, we close the switch. And when we do that, then the capacitor is going to discharge itself through the resistor. And it's going to take some time for the charges on the two plates of the capacitor to equalize, because the current has to go through the resistor. The initial charge is just Q0. That's going to be the capacitance C times the voltage across the capacitor, V0. Otherwise, you can just solve that for V0 and say that V0 is Q over C. And if we close the switch at time 0, what happens to the different quantities in this circuit? What does the current do? What does the voltage across the capacitor do? What does the voltage across the resistor do? Well, the charge is going to be an exponential decay. So initial charge times a declining exponential. The tau here is just the same tau that we had before, r times c, the resistance times the capacitance. The current is the rate of change of the charge. So the charge was a declining exponential, and it seems, and you see the current is a declining exponential too. This makes sense because when the capacitor is fully charged, it's got a lot of voltage and it's going to push the current fast through the resistor. As the capacitor discharges, it has less voltage, so it's not going to be pushing the charge quite as hard through the resistor, and you're not going to get as much current. In terms of the actual initial values, the initial value of the current is going to be the initial value of the voltage divided by the resistance, because that's what the capacitor is pushing across the resistor. The voltage across the capacitor is going to be directly proportional to the charge on the capacitor. That's the capacitor relation that the capa that's the capacitor relation that the capacitance is the that's the capacitor re that's the capacitor relation that the capacitance is the charge divided by the voltage. So then the voltage is Q over C, the charge divided by the capacitance. The voltage across the capacitor is just going to be the opposite of the voltage across the resistor. That's by Kirchhoff's voltage law, or the loop rule. The total voltage around the circuit has to add up to zero. But in terms of if you, if you measure the voltage across the resistor, across the capacitor, they're going to track down exactly the same. 